So now a bit of a change of pace. We're moving on to our next big major topic, which is statistical inference. We kind of we've laid all the important foundations, right? We have some nice methods of descriptive statistics that we can use. We've done a certain amount of probability theory, um, and we can put those pieces together to start talking about um, statistical inference. Statistical inference is famously one of the conceptually difficult topics that we cover, and these two guys here are clearly not impressed by having to talk about statistical inference right now. But they are leading off our lecture because to illustrate what statistical inference is about, we'll start off with an example about opinion polling, which is a great example, and one that everyone can relate to, I think, of statistical inference. So the question is this, who would win a federal election if it were held now? Um, now I'm going to follow the links to all these things today. So a recent poll suggests it would be the Labor Party. So hence Bill is happy and Mal not so much. But let's have a look at this recent poll because this is what we want to focus on a little bit. All right, so here's the news report. So this company called Ipsos that does polling on these kinds of things in Australia. Um, and we'll zoom in on the highlighted part, so you can follow these links too if you want to. Um, so a national poll of 1,400 respondents. So that's, this, that's how many people were uh, polled about their opinions. Were interviewed between the 22nd and 25th of March. So sometime last week this poll was carried out. Um, and it shows that the Labor Party was chosen by 55% of the respondents and the Coalition or the Liberal Party by 45%. So, for our purposes, that's all we're going to take out of this poll. Now, there's, there's, uh, there's actually a whole range of kind of uh, complicated things that goes on if we want to use this kind of information to relate to what an election, uh, how an election would turn out, right? Because we have minor parties and we have preferential voting and all of this kind of stuff. But for our purposes, let's just imagine that what's going on here is there are two parties, a Labor Party and a Liberal Party, and people are going to vote for one or the other and whoever gets the most votes wins. Okay, let's just think of it like that. That's um, enough to discuss this, um, the, the outcome of this poll. So what this would be saying is obviously if this poll were to um, materialise in the election, then the Labor Party would win because they would get 55% of the vote. Okay? Um, so let's bear in mind those numbers, the 55% and the 45%. Let's also bear in mind the number of respondents, 1,400. And we'll return in a few minutes to talk about how those numbers were actually, um, were actually found. All right. All right, how is this done? The sample of 1,400 voters were surveyed. Now, what we're doing by interpreting the outcome of this poll as saying Labor's going to win the election is where um, kind of extending the results from these 1,400 voters to all of the voters who would actually go to the polls in an election. So these 1,400 voters are called our sample, and then there is a population of all possible voters, and how many of those are there? Well, there's 15.8 million, and that's not a made-up number, so if you look at, go to the Australian Electoral Commission and look up the numbers, uh, as of whenever that is, updated on the 13th of January this year, there were uh, roughly 15.8 million people in Australia in, eligible to vote. Okay? So those are the numbers that we're talking about. So what we're doing, and this is, our, this is, this is an example of statistical inference. We're taking the results of a sample of 1,400 voters and using them, taking them as being representative, as being informative about what would happen if all 15.8 million people went to the polls. So the whole point about statistical inference is to address the question of why we think we're allowed to do that. What is it that lets us think that there is enough information in 1,400 voters to give some kind of uh, reasonable idea, not a perfect idea, but a reasonable idea of what would happen in an election involving 15.8 million people. Okay, so that's that's statistical inference in a nutshell. We have a small amount of information in a sample, but we want to uh, infer from that something about the behaviour of the underlying population. 
And that's what we haven't been doing so far. When we did descriptive statistics, we said something like, well, you know, 55% say yes, and that's, then we stopped, right? That described what was in the sample. Now we want to take this additional step to use that sample information to say something about the, about the population. Um, so a common kind of, uh, okay, there's two common responses to this kind of information. First of all is kind of the instinctive one that we saw, which is, well, 55% uh, of people support Labor, so Labor's going to win. Right? But that's obviously too strong a conclusion because we only have 1,400 in our sample. So we can't be sure that Labor's going to win. Okay? So what might be more interesting is to figure out what's on the basis of this information, what's the probability that we think that Labor's going to win, for example. That would be a, a better way of phrasing that conclusion. And we're, we're going to talk about exactly that. Um, now, the other kind of response that you get to information such as this is, well, that's a ridiculously small sample relative to the number of people who are going to vote. Okay. How can we possibly learn about 15.8 million people on the basis of only 1,400? Um, and therefore these numbers should just be completely dismissed. They don't tell us anything at all. Um, now, that's not necessarily true if those 1,400 voters have been selected carefully in the right kind of way. And we're going to talk about that today. All right, statistical inference, I've essentially told you this already. Statistical inference is the process of trying to use information in a sample uh, to infer something about the underlying population. Um, the example being something like we survey a few voters, find out which one they prefer, and then try and figure out from that what will happen when everybody votes. Uh, another one that we're going to play with as we go along is this one, which is um, QM1 marks. Uh, so we've looked at QM1 marks before from this semester last year and done some descriptive statistics on those. Um, now here's a different take on this. Let's suppose that you have available to you just 20 marks that uh, students have obtained in, in this subject. To what extent can you extend the information in those 20 marks to figure out what the average mark is, let's say, in the whole subject, which has about between 1,400 and 1,500 students in this subject? Um, so, what you could imagine, for instance, is um, at the end of the semester, you've got your mark and you're wondering, is this in any way representative of how the subject was for everybody else? And it's a bit of a natural kind of human response to think, you know, maybe, maybe you got 85 and you're feeling pretty happy and then you think, oh, the subject wasn't that hard after all. And probably nobody else found it very difficult either. Um, or alternatively, you've just scraped through with your 51 and you're deeply relieved and thinking, geez, that was really hard and I'm glad I got through this and I guess everyone else had to struggle as well. Um, now, extrapolating your own personal experiences to the entire class is obviously not going to be um, very reliable as a way of getting a gauge on how the class as a whole went. So what, maybe what you do is you, th is you think, well, I got on really well with the people in my tutorial. Okay, and in your tutorial, you've got 16, 18, 20 kind of people. So you contact all of them, message them or something, and you all exchange your marks and you've got 20 marks then. And you work out the average of those 20 marks. And you think, okay, now I've got an idea of how this subject really went because I've averaged everyone in my tutorial and the average was something, you know, 65 or something. And that tells you what the subject was like. The question is, is an average formed across that many students, let's say a roughly a tutorial's worth of students, just to what extent is that informative about the, uh, the average of the subject as a, as a whole? Um, and we're going to investigate that. These two questions, I don't know if you can tell at the moment, but these two questions are pretty much the same kind of thing. Um, all right, in order to be able to start being more careful and rigorous as to how this um, inference procedure is going to go, we need to start introducing uh, the concept of how the sample is gathered. So, so far we've said, for instance, well, 1,400 people were surveyed. But where do those 1,400 people come from in order to get themselves surveyed? And that um, process of choosing them is vitally important to the success or otherwise of the, of the statistical inference and whether it provides something reliable. So what we want is to collect a sample that provides reliable infer inference about the population. Now, I'm not being very specific yet about what reliable means. That's going to take us a few lectures to work out what we really mean by reliability and how we might measure that. 
It's enough for the time being to introduce this concept of a simple random sample. Uh, a simple random sample is, as the name suggests, a simple way of gathering a sample, the simplest one in fact. Um, and it has two, this is what you would, if you were sent out to gather a, uh, a random sample uh, from a population, you would presumably do something like this. Um, a simple random sample, so it's quite an intuitive thing, a simple random sample is a sampling scheme with two properties. The first is every individual in the population has to have an equal probability of being included into the sample. So in other words, you must not be gathering your sample in such a way as certain members of the population have a higher probability of being included than other members of the population. Okay. If you start kind of biasing the probabilities of your sample towards certain members of the population, then you can start biasing your inferences. Okay, and I'll give you some examples of that pretty soon. The other one that will come in handy a bit later on, I won't dwell on all that for too long right now, but the other one is that each individual is selected into the sample, or not, um, independently of every other individual. Okay, and I'll give you an example of this as well. We'll focus mostly on this equal probability one, anyhow because this is important for the, for the validity of the, of the inference that follows. All right, oh, I'll just mention, we're going to focus pretty much entirely for this subject on this simple random sample concept. It gets across all the important ideas, it helps you understand what's going on with statistical inference, and lots and lots of sampling is done using simple random sampling or something very, very like it. Um, other more complicated sampling schemes are possible. In fact, you can spend semesters studying nothing but ways of gathering samples. Okay, so it is quite a, a science all on its own, but we can get a long way just by understanding what's going on with a, with a simple random sample. All right, so here are some possible ways that we might think about how those 1,400 individuals were gathered for that political poll for voting intentions that we saw just before. For example, is this reminding you of a simple random sample in any way? Let's suppose a media outlet such as ABC Radio National or maybe Sky News during one of their broadcasts opens up the phone lines and the Twitter feed and the email and everything else and says, let us know in the next half hour who you're going to vote for. Okay? And then at the end of that half hour or hour or something, they close, close it all off, count up, the, count up the votes and say, well, according to the people who contacted our show, this is how the, the vote's going to go. Okay? Um, now, I think it's pretty clear that this is not a simple random sample. It falls short um, in a number of respects. Um, there's no particular randomization going on. So people are just volunteering to go into the sample. And the people who are volunteering are clearly in no way representative of the general population who would be voting in an election. Um, if it were ABC Radio National who were throwing open the, the, the phones and everything else, then we would be expecting to get a certain demographic which would favour uh, the Labor Party and vice versa with if the Sky News TV people were doing it, we'd expect to be getting um, a section of the population which probably skews more towards the Liberal Party. So there would be, by virtue of this kind of um, construction of the sample, a bias such that you know, the ABC sample would have a higher probability of Labor voters being included. Sky News would have a higher probability of the Liberal voters being included. So this would not be a simple random sample because every individual in the population as a whole of eligible voters does not have an equal probability of being included into the sample. And as a result of that, you'd be getting some biased results. <clears throat> Here's some similar examples of, of the same kind of thing. Let's suppose <clears throat> you decided, well, this randomization thing is important. So this idea of people volunteering to go into uh, a poll is, is clearly uh, no use whatsoever. So instead, you go and sit at your local car dealership and you randomly select people to go into your sample or not. Okay? So you've gone to this car dealership 
And let's say as people walk in, you flip a coin. If it comes up heads, you put them in your sample. If it comes up tails, you don't put them in your sample. So you're doing some randomization, right? Probability of a half of entering the sample. Here's the problem. If the car dealership that you happen to go into is a car dealership such as this, then clearly the properties of your sample are going to be heavily skewed towards people of a particularly high income level. And we can expect a high income level to correlate somewhat with their voting intentions. And so by the time you finish collecting your sample here, you've probably oversampled the number of people who would end up voting Liberal. So there is not an equal probability of every individual in the sample being selected into a, into, um, sorry, in the population being selected into a sample collected at this particular car dealership. Some nice photos, aren't they? Maybe I should forget about the overheads. We'll just sit here and look at the photos for a while. What do you reckon? Should we take a vote on that? Um, only some of you, though. <coughs> All right. And just in the interests of proper balance, exactly the same concept could apply here. We go to this veggie bar in Brunswick Street, Fitzroy, and do the same sampling process. Toss a coin, 50% you're in the sample, 50% you're out of the sample. You're going to have the same problem, right? So um, you're going to be oversampling people who I would suggest are more likely to be voting Labor and, over, and undersampling people who are more likely to be voting Liberal. So you need to be more clever than these kinds of admittedly silly ideas for gathering um, observations on voting intentions. All right, here is how uh, Ipsos goes about it. They use random digit dialing. Uh, there's a link there, you can follow it if you like. Basically what's going on with random digit dialing is they are selecting the people that they're going to contact to poll uh, according by just generating random numbers, re generating random phone numbers. The idea being whatever your phone number is, is not related to what your voting intention might be. So you can't look at your phone number and tell whether you're more likely to be a Liberal voter or a Labor voter. And so that should not be biasing the sample in any way by selecting on the basis of your phone number. Um, right? That's more or less true probably these days. But there's a famous example that's related to this, which goes back a little while. And this is a famous example because this example of a poll that went wrong that was based on phone numbers was actually really what started off the whole science of opinion polling and constructing these samples in a, in a scientific way that we're talking about right now. So what happened in 1936 was that um, a magazine called the Literary Digest set about trying to predict who was going to win the forthcoming presidential election. So there was a Republican candidate, um, Landon, uh, running against F.D. Roosevelt, who was the, who was the Democrat. Um, and this magazine decided to run a poll and find out who they thought was going to win ahead of time. Now, these guys did not mess around with tiny little sample sizes like 1,400. They went for a sample size that looks more like that, a sample size of around 2.4 million. They were serious, right? And the way that they did that was using phone records. So they gathered, they went around as many records of, of um, phone numbers as they could and gathered them all up and they didn't randomly sample, they just got as many people as they could. Just keep ringing them up and contacting them and getting their voting intentions. And at the end of that process, and they had, I mean, so not everyone responded, but their sample size was enormous, right? It wasn't 1,400, it was, it, was in, in, it was over a million. And they decided, well, clearly the Republican's going to win easily. So the numbers are here somewhere. You should read this, it's easy to read, it's, it's quite fun. And they decided, here it is, for the 1936 election, the prediction was the Republican would get 57% and the Democrat would get 43. 57% and the Republican 43%. So very strong evidence apparently that the uh, Republican was going to win. And this is a big sample, remember. So it's got to be good, right, if you, if you sample millions of people. The only problem was when the results came in, it looked like this. The Democrat, Roosevelt, got 62% and hammered the Republican who only got 38 
So despite the large sample for this survey, it was hopeless, right? It completely got it wrong. Okay. So you might be annoyed that the, the polls for, for Trump versus Hillary didn't quite get it right, but they were pretty close, right? We're talking about minor percentages. This was out by something like 20% with a sample size of, of 2 million. So the problem was, and you've got to remember this is 1936, the problem was not everyone had phones back then. And the people who did have phones tended to also have a lot of money. So having a phone was not quite as good as having a Bentley, but it was pretty good, right? It was a sign of having a lot of money and that you were more likely to be voting Republican as well. So this was, in fact, a biased sample because of that. Now, these days, obviously, people are more likely to have phones. Um, most people have phones, but not everyone has phones. There are some people who are too poor or too alternative or something like this that they don't have phones, and if that's true, they cannot be included into this Ipsos poll. So to some extent, that phone um, technology that they're using to generate these phone numbers and, and dial them up and survey people is not perfect. There will be some people being excluded from that. But they would argue very few, so not enough to severely bias the results in the way that those results in 1936 were being biased. That's really the point. Um, so, in the evaluation of any kind of random sample, it's important to think through these kinds of questions. Is, um, is the way that the sample is being collected likely to exclude or overrepresent certain proportions of the, um, of the population and hence bias the results? This last one, just quickly, we'll, we'll come back to the dependence a bit later on, but this would be an example of a sampling scheme in which um, you start introducing, or you, you fail the second criterion of, of, de, of independence between the individuals in the population. So suppose the Ipsos people were surveying people and they're ringing up phones and they're ringing up, let's say, landline phones at a particular house and someone answers the phone at that house and they survey them about their voting intentions and then the, the Ipsos people say, oh, look, we're on a winner. We've got someone who's actually answered the phone. Can we talk to the other people in the house and survey them as well, all at the same time? And so they might end up surveying two or three or four people all on the one phone number. Now, as soon as they do that, they violated the second condition about independence because, at least on average, people living in the same household will have a higher tendency to vote in similar ways. Okay? It's not perfectly predictable, but there will be a higher tendency to vote in similar ways relative to just randomly chosen people with different phone numbers. Now, they don't do that, obviously, but so they're too smart for that, but that would not be a good uh, idea because that would violate the independence. And that, if you follow that link to the 1936 story, it finishes with this kind of moral, which is exactly right, which is um, a small, well-designed sample is much better than a large, poorly designed one. And so a large sample can lead, if it's poorly designed, can lead you astray in a large way. That's what that example shows you. All right, so that's the sample design, and any kind of instance of sample design needs to be evaluated along those kinds of uh, those measures. Um, now let's turn to the statistical inference itself, and how do we start to talk in a more formal way about how statistical inference can tell you about features of populations. So we use the, um, the terminology and notation of random variables that we've been using over the last few lectures. And this problem of statistical inference can be formalised using random variables. So a random variable, remember, consists of the possible values that it can take, the possible outcomes, the numbers, and the probabilities, <coughs> the probabilities of those numbers or the PDF if it's a continuous random variable. And we can use these to describe populations. So for example, a random variable that could be defined to talk about or to model the process of opinion polling looks like this. So we define a random variable called x and that random variable x only needs to take two values because there are only two possible responses to the opinion poll, Labor or Liberal. Okay, we're keeping it simple. So the random variable could be coded as a 1 if the voter says that they are going to vote Labor and a 0 if they're going to vote Liberal. Okay, so a random, a random variable has to have a numerical outcome, so the one and the zero copes with that, and it contains all the information that the survey um, that the survey asks them. Now we are interested, if we're interested in trying to predict the election, we're interested in p, the probability 
of a voter voting a voter preferring Labor or one minus P of preferring Liberal. Um, and that's rep that P is representing the proportion of Labor voters in the entire population. Okay, not in the sample, in the entire population of voters. That's the P. If we knew that P, then we would know who's going to win the election, because if P is greater than a half, there are more potential Labor voters, or more prospective Labor voters than Liberal voters, so Labor's going to win if P is greater than a half. If P is less than a half, then the Liberals are going to win. So what we would really like to know is this P. That's, that tells us who would win. Okay. Now, we can't know it perfectly because we only have a sample of 1,400 people. We don't have all 15.8 million. So the question is, how can we use this information in the sample of 1,400 people to figure out what that value of P might be and how likely it is to be above a half or below a half? Um, with the average mark kind of thing, it's... Uh, a similar kind of idea, except now we're talking about a mean instead of a probability. Um, so in the population, in this case it's a much smaller population, about 14 or 1,500 people, um, the random variable would denote the mark, and we might be interested in the average or the mean mark in the population, which would be represented as the expected value of that random variable. Okay, so this is the population mean across all of the people. And if we had, if we consider the marks as being continuous random variables, because there's a lot of possible outcomes, so we'll model it as being continuous, there'll be some density function and this uh, expected value could be represented as this integral. Okay. We generally don't have to do this, but that's just to relate it to the fundamental definitions that we saw last time. So what we're particularly interested in is this last question here. We have 20 marks. We've drawn a sample of 20 marks. We've worked out the average of those 20 marks. What does that average tell us about the average of the entire population? Can we make inferences about the population on the basis of that sample average? So let's talk about the estimation of a mean first, and then we'll return to the estimation of the probability or the, or the proportion. <coughs> All right, so here's how it goes. We'll consider some population, the population, for example, being all the people in QM1, and uh, a distribution of marks across that population that has a mean of mu that we would like to try to get some idea about. Um, then take a random sample, a simple random sample ideally, of n observations, n students, let's say, from this population. So n will generally be a lot smaller, like 20 or something. The notation that we'll set up looks like this. So we're going to take a number of observations from this population. So we're going to need a number of random variables to denote these, these observations. So x1 will be our first random variable, which is representing the first observation, the first the mark of the first student who is selected into our sample. Um, and just to emphasize that this is a random variable. I mean, ultimately, it will be a number. But before we take the sample, we don't know what that mark is going to be. And if we took a different sample, we would get a different mark for the first student in the sample. Okay, so this is, for our purposes, from a statistical perspective, what defines something as being random is if you took another sample, you would get another value for that variable. That makes it a random variable. Okay? That's going to, maybe that seems obvious. That's going to be an important concept to bear in mind as we go through the next, the next lecture or so. So another sample would generally give you a different observation. Similarly with the rest. So if you take a sample of size n, then you have n random variables, each one of them corresponding to uh, one of the observations that you draw. And you can imagine if you took a different sample, you'd get a different set of n observations, and so these things are, are random. Whatever numbers you get, you take the sample mean, the x bar. You add them up, you divide by n, just as you're used to doing. And this x bar is also a random variable. So obviously if you draw a different sample of students, you will get a different collection of marks, and therefore when you take the sample mean of those, almost certainly you'll get a different value for that sample mean as well. Okay, so it's random. A different random sample gives you a different value for the sample mean. Um, just to 
illustrate, put some numbers around that kind of um, story. In, back in lecture two, we actually worked out the mean mark for uh, semester one 2016 and found that it was 62.11. So that would be our population mean here. So if we're imagining uh, those 1,416 students, I think it was, as being our population, then the average mark, this is, the average mark was 62.11. So this is a bit of an unusual situation in that usually in statistical inference you don't know what the population value is. If you did know, you wouldn't take it any further. Um, but just for illustrating the concept, it's kind of handy to have, just sitting there in the background, what we know about the population in this case. The population mean was 62.11. That's the mu. All right, let's suppose we don't have that available. You don't have the full set of statistics available, but instead you've only got 20 students' marks. Okay, you've got your friends from your tutorial, or you've done a random sample and picked out 20 students and got their marks. Okay, you don't have the full set. For instance, you might have got some numbers that look like this. Okay, so X1 up to X20 might be that set of marks right there. And that is an actual random, that's a random sample of 20 that I did take from the underlying population. So that's the real thing. Those are some real marks that were randomly sampled using a simple random sample from the population in semester one, 2016. Um, and we're going to illustrate more of this um, next week. Anyhow, anyway, so there's a sample. And here's the mean of those numbers, 65.1. So computationally, this is easy, right? You just work out that mean. The question is this. Is this 65.1 to be considered a good estimate of the underlying population mean? Well, in this case, we happen to know the answer. So you can see that it's kind of not too far away, I guess. You know, it's about three marks too high, but that's not disastrous. You know, if you're using 20 observations to work out a mean when, in fact, there's 1,400 and something of them, then maybe you'd say you haven't done too bad. But all of that is a very informal, unscientific kind of way of looking at this, and it depends on knowing what the correct answer is anyway. So ultimately what we need is a way of looking at a result like this and trying to evaluate how meaningful we think that really is about the underlying population, how precise it is, how reliable it is. Okay? So we're going, to, we're going to get there as we go along. Here's the language that's important for this application here. This, we have a sample mean, X bar. We have a population mean, mu, and we're using the sample mean as an estimator. That's our new term here. The sample mean is an estimator for the population mean. And in general, a sample anything is an, is an estimator for the population anything. So we could do this with a variance, and we will pretty soon. So a sample variance is an estimator of population variance, and so on. And we want to evaluate how good an estimator is, or what makes it good, or what makes it reliable or not. Um, a different random sample bit, I've told you that. All right. Uh, let's turn to this other application that we've got as well, um, which is the estimation of a proportion. So this is more to do with our voting example, right? So when we're modelling marks, then our x's can take kind of any value between 0 and 100, right? When we're modelling voting intentions, our x's can be 1's or 0's. There's only two possibilities, right? So x1 up to xn, same, they're random variables, just like before, representing the observations that we gather from the sample, and they take values of either 0 or 1. So imagine what the data looks like for the, what, the, what the Ipsos people have, right? They've done their sampling and they've done, they've spoken to, to 1,400 people on the telephone and what they've got is, uh, of those 1,400 people, a whole pile of people who said Labor and they, for them they put a one in the spreadsheet. And then they've got all the people who said Liberal and for them they put zero. So basically what's in the, in the data is lots of ones and lots of zeros corresponding to each of these voting intentions. And the probability that any one of those observations is equal to 1 is being denoted by this P that we saw. So the probability, this is the overall proportion in the population of uh, Labor voters. And the zeros have probability of 1 minus P. Now, notice something kind of neat here. If you want to just count up, you have N of these observations, so 1,400 in the example. If you want to count up 
how many of them are equal to one, then that's exactly the same operation as adding up all of those random variables. Okay, so if you take these x's and add them up, you're going to be going, you know, 1 plus 1 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 1. And you can see that all that you're doing in the process of adding up those random variables is counting how many ones you've got. So here's just a very simple little example where we have five random variables, a 1 and a 0. So the realizations or the data look like 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. So there's two ones in there, right? Equivalently, if you add up those random variables or those outcomes, then you get two. You're adding up two ones and three zeros. Um, now, that might seem kind of trivially simple, but you'll see in a minute why I'm emphasizing that. If you can add up those random variables to get the number of ones in your sample, then you can add up the random variables and divide by n, and that will give you the proportion of ones in the sample. Okay? So here we have in this formula, adding up the x's, number of x's in the number of ones in the sample, divided by n, which is the total size of the sample. So when you divide them, you get the fraction or the proportion of individuals in the sample who answered one. But of course, that's just x bar, right? This process of adding up these x's and dividing by this, the sample size is nothing but taking the sample mean. So working out the proportion of ones in a sample simply involves working out the sample mean of the zeros and the ones. Now the notation that we'll use here, in a, just to keep things somewhat in touch with what's going on in the textbook, uh, the p hat is denoting, so something with a hat on it is a sample estimate. So the p hat is the sample proportion, the proportion of ones, and the p is the population proportion of ones in the, in the full population. Okay? So we're using the p hat here as an estimator of the p. But as we've just shown, this p hat is exactly the same thing as taking the sample mean of the data that we have, all the ones and the zeros. Um, so why is that? Well, let's, I'll show you the numbers first. Um, so just talking about these ones and zeros and stuff like this, you can see that if you add them up, you get two, and there's five of them. So if you go two over five, it's telling you that 0.4 or 40% of these numbers right here are equal to ones. Um, so I'm dwelling on this because, you know, there's textbook reading assigned for this, and there's a whole section on estimating the mean and there's a whole section on estimating a proportion. And so far as you can tell from the textbook, those are two completely different things, right? But they're not two completely different things. They're two exactly the same things, really. In both cases, you take your data, you add it up, you divide by the sample size, and you've got the statistic that you want. And the statistic then is used as an estimator of the underlying proportion. Okay, so all the way through, you know, there's going to be in the textbook a whole chapter on estimating a mean and another whole chapter on estimating a proportion. The reality is those two problems are essentially the same thing. And so we're not going to inflict that kind of thing on you where you do two completely, um, different, two completely different treatments of the same problem. So we'll talk about estimating means using continuous things like marks and we'll talk about estimating proportions using zero ones. And treat them as being basically the same kinds of problems. So you've only got to remember how to do things one way and not two. If you could imagine what this would look like in the case of the um, kind of opinion polling stuff, then what we would have, uh, I've kind of mentioned this, you would have 1,400 uh, zeros and ones here. And for example, you might have in the spreadsheet 770 of the x's being equal to 1, they're those who said Labour. 630 x's being equal to 0, they're the ones who said Liberal. And so the p hat estimate here, which is the estimator of the proportion of people in the population who would vote Labour, would be the sum of all of these x's, which would equal 770, the number of 1's. So that's the 770 there, the number of ones, divided by the full sample size, which is 1,400, and that would work out to be 0.55. Remember in the, po in the, in the polling story it said 55% of the respondents favoured Labor over Liberal. 
So that's the kind of calculation that would have gone on behind the scenes to arrive at that eventual 55% kind of number. And what that 55% number is being used as is an estimate of P, which is the proportion of, of prospective Labor voters in the population if the full population went to, uh, went to an election in that, what was it, last week. All right, so where we need to go from there is to start putting some rules in place that allow us to understand when a number like this P had a 0.55 is really a useful guide to the actual population value P. So at the moment we don't know, right? We have these 1,400 observations. We don't know if they're, they're providing a good measure of the population or not. So we want some kind of idea of that. And that's what we're going to start doing as of the, um, as of the next lecture. I'll see you then. Thank you.